This is the third video out of four, and, is, uh, and these videos are designed to be a brain dump for myself, describing four key urological topics that I found relevant in my 10-week urological rotation as an intern. This video is designed to be an educational video, however I hope that other, other people may find it just as useful as I will find it for myself. This third topic we're going to talk about is kidney stones. And I've drawn a diagram of the renal tract here with bilateral kidneys, and these being hypothetical stones at the three main junction points, the bladder and the urethra coming out. I think it's pretty important to understand the basic anatomy of kidney stones and where they get caught so you can explain this to the patient and influence what kind of management you would like them to have and what would be better for the patient and for the hospital. A pretty key to, thing to know is that there are three main areas where the a kidney stone can get caught up in. And this one is, the first one is the PUJ, or the pelvo, pelvic ureteric junction. So pelvic is the renal pelvis, Pelv, pelvis coming from the Greek word for funnel, I think. So this funnels into the ureter, so that the junction between there, that's a, a, a sticking point. It's also known as the proximal ureter. Um, this one is the mid ureter, or the pelvic brim. And then that's where the ureter runs over the iliac crests. Another main point of stickage. The final point here is the junction between the, the bladder as well as the ureter. And the bladder is also known as... Uh, the, sorry, the bladder can be also described as the cycle. For example, intravesical BCG means into the bladder BCG. And... This junction is known as the VUJ, or the vesicle ureteric junction. So it's fairly logical the way that these are called. Management, I've listed over here, and it really determines on two main things, in my opinion. So the first thing is the location. And the second thing is the size of the stone. So let's talk about the size of the stone. Usually for stones which are like less than 5 millimeters in size, you can have a trial of conservative management. Conservative management is pretty much saying you're not going to do anything. You're just going to watch the patient. Hopefully they will pass the stone by themselves and you won't have to deal with them after that. So this includes um, pain relief. So the urologists seem to love um, indomethacin, which is a non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drug. Um, and they like it PR. I'm not particularly sure why, but they just like it PR. They like to put things up people's backsides, even if it's not their finger. The reason why endomethacin works, particularly well for the nausea as well, is that the, the kidneys are, um, are supplied by the same nervous supply as the stomach. So that's why you get nausea and vomiting, because irritation of um, this particular kidney will feed back through the nerves and you'll get referred pain or referred symptoms from the stomach and one of the symptoms which comes from the stomach is nausea and vomiting. Apart from um, endomethacin you can also use your bread and butter morphine, paracetamol etc. Other medical therapy or conservative management is um, tamsulosin or other forms of alpha blockers and these supposedly work by relaxing this smooth muscle on either side of the ureter so by relaxing the smooth muscle on either side you get less contractions and less pain one interesting thing to know about tamsulosin is that it's only PBS listed or only gets subsidized by the Australian government if it's indicated for benign prostatic hyper hypertrophy so for the prostate um, in Australia. So if you use this for kidney stones, you have to pay the full price, which I think is 60 to $70 per box. Maybe this will change in the future. Um, so that's conservative management. After you, if your stone is large in size, and that say it's above five millimeters, but I don't know, I'm just making up things now, but let's say less than 10 to 12 millimeters, then you'll need operative management. And this is with ureteroscopy. So ureteroscopy is an endoscopic management. You go from, you go into the bladder, into the bladder, which is known as a cystoscopy. 
or rigid cystoscopy, you go up into the offending ureter, into the ureteric orifices. If you're grabbing a ureteric stone, then this is called ureteroscopy. If you're grabbing a stone from the renal pelvis, it's called piloscopy. And I think this is fairly useful when you're consenting someone for a procedure, because often you'll write, um, all you need to write for a consent procedure is everything that you're going to do. So the first thing you're going to do in someone who's got a 10 millimeter stone at the pelvis is you're going to go through, you're going to go through the urethra. Going, so you're going to do a rigid cystoscopy plus uh, ureteroscopy plus minus piloscopy. And what they do is, in order to grab the stone, if it's too big, then they tend to do they tend to do what is called um, lithotripsy. So this is breaking the stone using a laser, so laser lithotripsy. And they do basket retrieval of stone. Get that out of the way. They basket retrieve the stone, and the stone is usually retrieved in that way. Most of the times, however, this ureter isn't as large as what I've indicated here. It's quite a small, tight ureter, and in that case, you can't feed up um, the ureteroscope in, straight into the ureter. In that case, what you do is you uh, you go for a in-between step, which is insertion of a JJ stent. The whole point of a JJ stent is that this JJ tube um, holds, keeps this um, the ureter open and prevents obstruction because obstruction is a urolog one of the few urological emergencies. As I've drawn here, the JJ stent it's a kind of a coil at the top, it's a coil at the bottom, and it stays in there and keeps the ureter patent. That's ureteroscopy, which I find that the majority of operative management comes under. And then the next one they can do is ESWL, or extra shock, extracorporeal shockwave lithotripsy. And this is when you have a machine that produces high-frequency sonic blasts and destroys uh, kid kidney stones. So they tend to be stones which are in the in the in the kidney itself. So you might have a kidney on this side, a kidney stone, sorry, on this particular side, sitting in the lower pole. And in order to break this up, you can blast it. You can, you can blast it with ESWL. This will break it up. It'll shatter, and you can. The patient will pass the fragments later. The final thing for massive stones is PCNL or percutaneous nephrolithotomy, and percutaneous means goes through the skin. So say this is the side of the patient's body. You go through the patient's skin using a nephrostomy tube, you go into the renal pelvis, or you go into the kidney, and then you find the stone burden, which which is usually massive. I remember one lady, she had a three centimeter staghorn calculus. So all this renal pelvis was just full up with stone, and we went through using PCNL, visualized the stone and started hammering at it away. So we used a laser to hammer, it, hammer at it and extracted it from this nephrostomy tube. So that's more or less the basis of kidney stone management.